this series, which we've entitled Prophet, Priest, and King, giving us a, an intimate look uh, at who Jesus Christ is. The writer of Hebrews spelling out for us so far in chapter 1, the idea that, first of all, Jesus is better than just about everything. Well, he is better than everything. And that Jesus is better than angels, which last week we talked about. And remember, it seems a little peculiar that the writer would just throw that out there. You know, Jesus is superior to angels. But knowing that in our hearts, there's a tendency to uh, make religion about Jesus plus something or Jesus and more. I mean, Hodge was just talking about it, you know, the worship of saints and, and, uh, and the veneration of Mary and all that sort of stuff. It, our wicked, sinful hearts are going to tend to gravitate towards crafting a religion that is going to lessen the true God and raise up other idols in its place. Uh, the church uh, that was being written to here in this uh, epistle of Hebrews was struggling in such a thing of, of angelic worship. So as we come to the beginning of chapter 2, um, we see a therefore, therefore. That's what our, our text is going to start with today, therefore. Meaning that based upon what the writer had just said, I want you to take this to heart. Now, in the book of Hebrews, there's about five distinct warnings that the writer gives to the church. Five of them. Today is going to be number one, and it's going to be very succinct. It's not going to be as elaborate as some of the other warnings that we're going to get down the road, but it is no less important. And here's the warning. We have a lot of different words for it. Sometimes we call it uh, falling away. Sometimes we call it backsliding. Today, I want to call it drifting. Drifting. That's what the writer refers to. Drifting. Something we have to be on the lookout for, for very eternal reasons. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 2. I just want to read the first four verses today, and then we'll pray. The writer says, Therefore, we must pay Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Let's pray. God, I ask that you reveal your truth through your word today. I pray that uh, the Holy Spirit teach, not according to my desire or according to uh, uh, some sort of convention of my own, but that the words that are taught today that pierce the hearts of everybody here will be those of the Lord himself. Uh, Father, if there's something in my life or in any of our lives that needs rebuke or correction, I pray that you would would do just that through the power of your word. Lord, help us to have a, a perspective according to your word today, that makes us much more serious and and, uh, much more focused on what it is that we need to be about as believers in Christ. Thank you for your word that is always there for us. You've given it to us as such a great gift. Speak now, I ask in Christ's name. Amen. So, quickly this morning, what I want to do is I want to give you the warning that the writer of Hebrews throws out there. And then I think what the writer does is he gives a a couple reasons why that warning is significant. Now here's the warning. You ready? This is in your note sheet. So here's, here's point number one. Be warned that drifting from the truth of salvation is a real possibility. 
be warned that drifting from the truth of salvation is a real possibility. This is not rocket science that I'm sharing with you this morning. We are prone to drift as human beings. The writer here says, uh, therefore we must pay much closer attention. Now, think about that phrase. Doesn't that sound awkward when you read it? It says, therefore, we must pay much closer attention. If it sounds like the writer is using a lot of words, it's because he is. He's using more words than you would naturally use to make that point. Because he wants the point, he's, he's kind of like doubling down on the point that he's making. Pay much closer, must pay much closer attention to what we've heard. And here's the problem. If you don't, lest you run the risk of drifting away from it. Drifting. Drifting away. The word parareo, it means to be washed away or slip or drift by. It only shows up in the New Testament here. Only time the word's used. The image is that of a current carrying something off course. The book of Hebrews speaks to this danger in multiple places because it's a real danger for all of us. If we just, as a church, if we stop focusing on the truth of the salvation message, we will slowly drift away from it. And eventually you'll find yourself a church that's preaching another gospel. As a boy, I, I grew up spending lots of time on the Chesapeake Bay. Anybody been to the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland? Right. Greatest crabs in the world. Maryland blue crabs. Uh, everybody loves uh, some steamed Maryland blue crabs with Old Bay seasoning. It's the best. So that was my life growing up. I spent I spent weekends and summers on the bay fishing and eating Maryland blue crabs and laying the seeds for skin cancer uh, because my mother never put sunscreen on me. So you would, I would always come home French fried at the end of every day. So the, the Chesapeake Bay is, is kind of like more like an ocean than it is a, a, a bay. It's such a large body of water. It, it, the, the tides are, are still a pretty relevant thing. The water has quite a bit of current to it. And I can remember as my buddies and I, you know, in the summer, just playing in the water, we take our rafts out and we would paddle way out into the bay and and uh, goofing around and throwing each other off of our rafts and punching each other and um, doing everything that young boys do. And then not paying attention, you realize that the beach that you left from to go out into the bay is now about a mile down that way. Um, not because of anything we did, except that we weren't paying attention. The, the drift is going to happen. It's just part of the natural order of things. We drift. So what happened to us was we either ended up exhausting ourselves, paddle, having to paddle back to the original place where we put into the water, or we would paddle up to some strange beach and you'd have to walk a mile back to where it is that you came from. I remember about a year after Hurricane Ian, I was fishing up at Blackburn Point. And, uh, and I noticed that the backwater there was littered with boats, uh, swamped boats, where the hurricane had come through and just blew all these small sailboats and houseboats and everything else that people were living on and just dumped them right there. And the county has to go through, right? And every so many years, they got to haul out all these old boats. Uh, and I guess you throw them away. I don't know. What do you do with a boat? They 
they do something with them, but they had to be, they were, they were rotting in the water. Because the, the hurricane came along and just picked them up and, and moved them. And the writer here says, must pay much closer attention to. The emphasis here is huge. Um, if, you could, if you could translate it into really bad English, it would kind of sound like this. It is necessary with much more abundance to pay attention to this. That's kind of what the writer's saying. But pay much more abundant attention to what? Well, he says, therefore, we much pay closer attention to what we've heard, lest we drift from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression of disobedience received just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? There's the message. The salvation, the message of the salvation of Jesus Christ. Um, but it's hilarious. I'm driving down Proctor Road. I love to make fun of the Unitarian Universalist Church down here, right? So I'm driving down Proctor Road, and I notice that their sign is now advertising that a Brazilian Seventh-day Adventist church is meeting there on Saturdays. And I had two thoughts. I thought, wow, that's strange. Good for the Brazilian Seventh-day Adventist Church, I guess, that they have a place to meet. But strange that they chose to meet in a Unitarian Universalist church. I, as a church planter, I would meet most anywhere if somebody was going to give me the right place at the right price. You could, you know, you give me a back room at a funeral home, and if you told me it was free, I could try and start a church there. Um, I don't think I would meet at the Unitarian Universal Church because it muddies the message of salvation. We had an organization that approached me two weeks ago. It's a, a, a parochial school that they're starting, a Catholic school here in Sarasota. And they asked if they could rent our building from us so that they could meet here during the week. And they were very clear that they're an overtly Catholic school. I politely declined. Not that I wouldn't want a few extra bucks to help our ministry, but the flip side of that is people start thinking that we stand for Catholic theology, which we do not. I don't want to drift from the true message of salvation. So what have we heard? That's the question. The truth of the Word of God and the realities that it has for our life, like an anchor. The message of salvation is like a, an anchor for us. The Word of God and His truth is like an anchor for us. The answer to drift is always to tie off to something that doesn't move. So you anchor or you tie off to a pier. Anybody who's been on a cruise ship, you see those huge uh, pylons that they tie off to. Um, those things aren't going anywhere so that the ship doesn't drift. The apostles uh, declared the initial word. Shepherds, pastors, teachers continue to declare it today in order to prevent drift. If you ever think to yourself, sometimes Pastor, it sounds like you're saying the same thing over and over again. You know, I feel like you just said the same thing two weeks ago. And you said something about that last month. Why do you keep hammering on the same message of salvation? Why do you keep hammering on the same truths of the Word of God? Because if we don't anchor ourselves to those things, we drift away from them. I, there, there's, there's some stuff in this Word that, that we could disagree on and, and share heaven easily. But there's some non-negotiables that we can't disagree on and expect to share heaven. The way of salvation is one of those messages. See, you're only saved through Jesus Christ. No other way. Uh, so to, to think that it's Jesus Christ plus something meaning Jesus Christ plus how good of a life you live or that you're saved based upon 
Jesus and the work of Mary or Jesus and the work of the church or a priest, none of those things get you to heaven, just Jesus Christ. We come back to that. So as much as it seems like I just keep throwing this red meat out to you and y'all are like, amen, amen. I don't want us to forget it because the moment we forget it, we open ourselves up to being a mile down the beach, forgetting where we came from. And then nobody is able to get saved through our ministry. In Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 11, Paul kind of shares this truth. He says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by waves and and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. See, Paul's saying the same thing here. God gave pastors, apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers to equip the saints. Why? So that they are not tossed about all over the place by every wind and doctrine. I take this so seriously. I've mentioned this before. That's why I love to hear what you're reading. What podcasts are you listening to, right? Who are your favorite televangelist preachers? Because I feel like one of my jobs is to keep one ear to the ground and know where the false teaching is coming from and then be able to take us back to this so that we can anchor ourselves in the right place. I'm not out to, I'm not out, ever out to throw you under the bus or say, you know, hey, you chose the wrong book there and you're a bad person for it. That's not what I'm trying to do. I just want us all to have this unity in the faith and in the salvation message of Christ so that we can be most effective for the kingdom of God. And so that you all don't get harmed in the process. So Paul was concerned in another place that Timothy not drift, but stay rooted in the, in the word of God as well. He, he told Timothy, he said, continue in what you've learned. As Christians, we must not learn something and then pull up anchor or untie from the moorings or we'll drift. Paul uses the word here. He says, continue. It should be our mission every single day. We come to the word of God. Why uh, why read the word of God every day? Because I want to continue in it. I want to moor myself to it, anchor myself in it to prevent drift. Then the word of God can do its thing. According to Paul to Timothy, the word of God, when you root yourself in it, it's got a job to do. And that job looks like this, rebuking you. Meaning, if you're off course, or you got some bad thought about what the word of God really says, it's there to slap you across the hand. Correct. Slap your hand and get you back to what is actually true, to teach and to make you complete in Christ. Nothing is going to make you complete in Christ apart from this. And my question for you this morning, is that who you want to be? Do you want to be complete in Christ? Do you want to be anchored to his truth and nothing else? And what are you doing to get there? What does your daily routine look like? Is there time for you in God's word? Do you have a plan to strategically attack God's word? Um, To successfully stay anchored, you have to have a plan. Okay? You know that old saying, 
people who fail, if you, what is it? If you fail to plan, then you plan to fail. Organize your time and your agenda around personal time in God's Word. Not just the stuff you want to read either, but the stuff that it's all profitable. So read it all. Uh, are you structuring your time so that you're in a group of people so that iron can sharpen iron? Like Hodge was saying, you know, he's, they, they get herds of people that invade their apartment so that they can engage in the Word of God together. And I would imagine in a, in a Catholic culture like that, they're not finding that anyplace else. And are, are you carving out time to where you can sit under the authority of a, a preacher, teacher who you trust, who has been called and anointed by God to lead through the scriptures? For the unbeliever, it's even more important. Because for the unbeliever, drift means judgment, which means death. So that's, we come here to a place now as we wind this down that the writer gives two reasons why neglect to pay attention to what you've learned, like slipping away or drifting, is dangerous. I want to read those to you again, verses 2 to 4. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to His will. So two notes here, okay? Note number one. We must not slip because your judgment under the law was strict. God began judgment under the law. He said the message declared by angels, the law given to Moses, where Moses was the intermediary for man, and the angels put the law in place for God. And before you hang me up saying, what, what strange teaching is this? This seems like some sort of misinformation. I've never heard that before about angels putting the law into place. What is that? Know that this is a testimony of Scripture as far as the law was given. Galatians 3.19, Paul says, Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions, until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made, and it was put in place through angels by an intermediate. So, To the believers who were Jews, their understanding of Judaism would be such where they knew that angels had put the law into place through intermediary. Paul talks about it as if everybody should know this. You can see the look on some of your faces this morning. This is new information. Um, but now we're reading it in multiple places. Somehow, some way, God used angels to instill the law of the Old Testament. So he says, you got this law in the Old Testament, the message declared by angels, the law given by Moses, where Moses was the intermediary. The writer is reminding them of the baseline. He's saying, apart from the work of Christ, is the law. Before the work of Christ, you have the law. To transgress means to, there's a line that you dare not cross. To transgress means that you choose to step over that line. So when you cross over the line or you disobey, another word used, meaning you neglect or refuse to keep the law, it meant righteous retribution. God was going to pay back according to what it is that you did wrong under the law. That was judgment. Romans 6.23 For the wages of sin is what? Death. 
That's the payment, okay? So you deserve a payment for being a sinner. Not a good payment. Under the law, the payment that you deserve for being a sinner is death. That's the Old Testament law. That's the promise, the punishment, the judgment. Those who drift and choose to neglect salvation in Christ receive that punishment unto themselves. But not just that, but even in stricter judgment under the salvation of Christ. You say, what? No. There was a judgment under the law, and those who who transgressed against the law received a strict judgment. Those who were offered salvation in Christ and chose to transgress or disobey or reject salvation in Christ bring upon themselves an even stricter judgment than what was under the law. If God had dealt with the law through His Son and the price was so great upon His Son, then to neglect the Son's work means an even greater judgment. Why? There's no longer an escape for sin. If you transgress the law of the Old Testament, there is an answer for you, and that was Jesus Christ. That's everybody in this room. We have all broken the law of God in the Old Testament. The Bible says, for there's no one righteous, no, not one. The answer for that was Jesus Christ. If you now come to a place where you reject, you reject or transgress or disobey the law of the Old Testament, and you now reject the salvation message of Jesus Christ, you bring upon yourself an even stricter judgment, because there is now no answer for you. You've rejected God's lifeline. Unlike the covenant of old that was delivered by angels, the covenant of salvation, according to the writer of Hebrews, is delivered by Christ himself. So therefore, to willfully drift and neglect the salvation of Christ is the rejection of Christ himself. If we want to put Hebrews in context, and I'll tip my hand, and we'll fast forward a few chapters to chapter 12, verse 25. Later on, the writer will say this. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. Perhaps, perhaps we reject him by making light of him. Perhaps people reject him by ignoring him, by denigrating his sacrifice and his worth. Look, it's going on in the world all around us. People are denigrating the name of Christ and his salvation message. And because of it, they drift farther and farther away and they bring upon themselves a stricter judgment. Choosing drift, according to the writer of Hebrews, means you ignore the many signs and witnesses. Many signs. What signs? There's so many. I mean, we, we, we could just make a huge list here if we wanted to, if this was a Bible study class. There's so many signs that God has given, attesting to the salvation message, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The coming of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the writer says. Through his disciples early on, miracles were done and recorded in the Bible. God administered signs and wonders and these miracles. How do you, how do you neglect a God who raises people from the dead? How do you neglect a God? Who, this is why next week when we have our, uh, our witnessing training, one of the things I want us to be able to walk away with is a better ability and appreciation for how to use our story, like our testimony, to lead somebody else to Christ. Here's why. My story 
hopefully just like your story is one where at one point in time you were one way without Christ, but now because of the work of Christ in your life, you're different. And and people can't argue that. I'm changed because of I am a walking miracle because of what Christ has done in my life. Anybody who knew me as a 16-year-old would be like, there is no way that guy is going to be doing that for a living. There's no way he's going to be singing songs with people from the platform on Sunday morning. There's no way he's going to, he's, no, none of it makes any sense. He's going to be an engineer. He's going to be a business person. He's going to make lots of money. He's not going to do that. And, but, but God, Christ, he just, he wouldn't let me go. My life is different. The gifts of the Holy Spirit testify to what he's doing. And they testify to his truth. I joke about this all the time. I'm an introvert. I don't like talking to people. I don't really like being around people. It's nothing to do with how I view people. I love them. I think they're wonderful. And I, I enjoy ministering to people. And then I enjoy a big, long break where I don't have to be around people. And when God called me to be a pastor, I really thought like this was a problem. You're calling the wrong person. I don't like speaking in front of people. I don't like being around people, God. I, I just, I love people. I do. But how about somebody else, a little more gregarious, a little nicer, somebody with a little more mercy in their arsenal? And here we are. Because the gifts of the Spirit win out if you let them. So I'll close there. I just want to ask you this closing question based upon what the writer of Hebrews is telling us. As a church and as an individual, are we anchored to the truth of Christ? Are we anchored to, are we uncompromising in the truth of Christ? There is no way to heaven except to be saved by faith through the name of Jesus Christ. Let's keep anchoring ourselves to that message. Let's pray.